All right. The title of last week's lesson that we're going to review in a moment is If Any Man Be in Christ, because that's how verse 17 starts, and that's the verse we covered last week. Uh, I try to cut out things when I have to make changes. Uh, last week was not true 21, it was just 17, so uh, that's all that should be there, but I, I didn't catch that and erase the dash in the 21. Uh, but the title of this week's lesson is, Who's Counting? Not God. You ever tell somebody, somebody is saying something to you and you say, Who's Counting? You ever do that? Well, that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. Who's counting? Not God. But first, let's spend just a few moments reviewing the amazing verse, verse 17, that we covered last week. And that will set you up for verses 18 through 20 this week. The verse we covered last week was, If any man be in Christ, well, it starts with therefore. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I have two other translations. You know, King James Bible that a lot of people are familiar with was written in the 1600s in England, um, translating uh, the earlier manuscripts into English. And uh, But nowadays we've got, you go into a Bible bookstore, you've got translation after translation to pick from. They all basically say the same thing because they're translating pretty much from the same thing. But uh, each translator word puts it in uh, words that he thinks are more fluent or more whatever, in words that um, uh, he thinks uh, people today would understand better. For example, in the King James Bible, in 1 Corinthians 13, it said charity. If I have not charity, charity suffers long. And it says all these things about charity. Well, when you and I today in America think of charity, we think of um, some telethon where people are raising money for a cause. Or you think you drive through uh, McDonald's drive through now and they have a little thing there with a basket outside, donate. And they, you can drop in your change or something in there and donate uh, to some children's thing that they're pushing at this time. And all those causes are great. And that's what we think of with charity. But that's not what the Greek word meant, and uh, evidently that wasn't the way charity was used in the 1600s in England. It meant love. So, if I possess everything, but I don't have charity, the King James says, the modern translations render it in a way you and I would grasp it, and don't have love. And so, sometimes uh, I'll add another translation or two under the King James one that I put there just to help you see it in another light. So in the King James, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away, behold, all things have become new. A translation called God's Word renders it, whosoever is a believer in Christ is a new creation. King James said, any man be in Christ. He extends that out so you know exactly what being in Christ means. Whoever is a believer in Christ is a new creation. The old way of living has disappeared a new way of living has come into existence. Or the New Living Translation rendered it, what this means is that those who become Christians become new persons. They are not the same anymore. For the old life is gone, a new life has begun. Now last week I did something that I very seldom do. I don't know if I've ever done it before. When I was covering this, I didn't just have those two translations underneath the King James Version. I had five others. So I had the King James and then seven other translations because I picked translations that were all saying something a little different because I really wanted to drive home some of the things that verse 17 was saying. And so even though I don't have all those translations here, you'll see initials down below uh, and those initials stand for translations like KJV is King James Version, E. Uh, RV is the easy to read version. God's Word is GW, New American Standard, so forth. Um, is contemporary English version, so forth. So when you see all those, you don't have those verses here. I didn't have the room in review. But I just wanted to remind you of a couple things we shared. What is absolutely amazing about verse 17, if any man be in Christ? And, in, and then I took those seven other translations along with the King James to stress 
each part of that verse, what's so amazing about it? What's it saying to me? It informed me that since I am in Christ, belong to Christ, joined to Christ, a believer in Christ, one of those who become Christians, engrafted in Christ, everything about me is different. No. I did all that because I don't want you to get lost if any man be in Christ. Because you say, how do I get in Christ? And so I wanted all these other translations to lay it out for you. It simply means putting your faith in Christ, becoming a believer. Um, so after emphasizing all that, I said, how is everything about me completely different? Everything is different because, and I went back to the translations again, old things have passed away. The past is forgotten. The old things are gone. The old is gone. The old way of living has disappeared. The old life is gone. The old thing passed away. The old previous and moral and spiritual condition has passed away. And then we went on, what makes everything different about me? Uh, what else is true that makes everything different about me? Everything is different because all things become new and etc. So I really wanted to stress, when you become a Christian, you're not who you were before you were a Christian. Now, if someone goes to a Billy Graham crusade, now it would probably be his son uh, holding the crusades. Uh, Billy's in his 90s. But Billy used to fill up the ballparks. All, uh, all kinds of churches would get together in whatever big city he was going to and have their people invite friends and family. And he would get 60,000, 70,000 in a major league ballpark. And uh, uh, I think he hit over 100,000 one time in, in a big park. And uh, he'd give an altar call. He'd preach that you must be born again, give an altar call, and thousands would come down. And uh, research has shown that only about 7 out of 100 of those that came forward had any change, started going to church, had any real change. So only 7% might have indeed become Christian. But when you're dealing with 10,000 people coming forward, I'm going to even know 7% is not bad. Those 7% didn't go home the way they came. Now, I'm going to tell you something. When they got home, went in the house, their husband didn't notice the difference. The wife didn't notice the difference. The children didn't notice the difference. The parents didn't notice the difference. But they were different. And time would bear that out. They became a brand new person. And what I love about that verse, before we move on to this week, is he says, If any man be in Christ, he is. Present tense. A new creature. Old things are. Present tense. Passed away. All things are. Present tense. Become new. In our reality, these things are progressive. In God's reality, he sees it as done. God sees the finished work. You know why God puts up with you on your bad days? How many ever have any bad days? Do you know why a holy God puts up with you on a bad day? Because He's not looking at the mess you are. He's looking at the end result. He already sees. He sees outside of time. In His reality, you're already sitting in heaven with Him. He sees the finished product. How many of you would like to see the finished product? I tell you, I look in the mirror, I don't see no finished product. But uh, when I look in this mirror, this, the Bible is often compared to a mirror. When I look in this mirror, I see a finished product. When I look in my bathroom mirror, I think, oh my God, why don't you strike me dead now? That's not a prayer, God. That's not a prayer request. <laughs> Just wondering out loud. That's not a prayer request. All right. So, now let's go on to this week's lesson. We'll pick it up with verse 18, right after it said, that, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Uh, verse 18 goes on to say, And all things are of God, who has reconciled us to Himself by Jesus Christ, and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Alright, so, he's saying, all things are of God. So I ask the question under there, and the reason I have these questions and answers on here, you know, everybody's trying to reproduce themselves. I, I put these things together this way because I want to teach you how to approach the Scripture when you're reading it in your private time. You analyze it. So he said, all things have become new. What all things? What's become new here? What are the all things 
Or it said all things are of God. What are the all things that are of God? It's the same all things in verse 17. At the end of the verse where it said all things have become new. The next phrase, and all things are of God. Same Greek word. One Greek word is rendered all things in both of these verses. The same member of the New Testament was written in Greek. And uh, the same Greek word, both places. The all things is the same subject both times. So up here in verse 17, he says these all things are become new. And he explains it in verse 18 by saying the, the reason they become new is because they're of God. All things, the all things that have become new are those things that are the work of God in your life. Everything has become new there. Now not only has God made everything new. I don't even know all things is pretty inclusive. Right? Not only has he made everything new, he then goes on and says about God, he said, who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. So, we're going to be looking at this idea of reconciliation. But first we're going to back up to verse 17 where it said all things have become new. And, you know, I tell you guys around here a lot, if you want, if you don't have a clear understanding of an English word, you get out Webster's Dictionary or New World Dictionary or some such thing, right? If you don't understand a certain word in the Bible, they're all translated from a Greek word. You go to Thayer's Greek Dictionary. Thayer is a a man who explains how the Greek words that are rendered in the New Testament were used in those days. What they meant way back then at the turn of the B.C. to the A.D. And uh, in other words, in Jesus' time. The word new there doesn't mean... It could refer to a new car, but it basically means when it deals with substance, it's of a new kind. Of a new kind. Not the kind you got. All things have become new. It's of a new kind. Listen, it's unprecedented. Never happened before. When all things become new in your life, it's something that is unprecedented in your life. Never happened before. It's novel. Not a novel that you read. It's novel. It's different than other stuff. Not only is it novel... It is uncommon and unheard of. That's what the Greek word rendered all things have become new means. That's what God did in your life. He did something that never been heard of. Now, we've heard of it because the church has been in existence 2,000 years now. But I tell you, when he started saving people in the first century, nobody had ever heard of it. There was no such thing. Nobody got saved in the Old Testament. Nobody who died in the Old Testament immediately went to heaven. They went to a place, those who had faith in God, called paradise. And there they waited until Jesus died for their sins, rose again the third day, ascended to heaven, uh, and uh, then uh, offered the blood of His sacrifice on the real altar in heaven. Then He descended into paradise, preached the gospel to them, and the Old Testament saints readily embraced the gospel, and they were born again. But until that day... Until that day, when Jesus first started preaching the gospel, nobody had ever been saved. It was unheard of. It was novel. It was something completely new. And that's what happens in your life. Now, it isn't to the same extent new because other people have been saved. But it's new to you. It's something that was unheard of in your life before. It's something that is novel in your life. It's something that is uncommon. All right? So, that's what this idea is. This idea of all things becoming new. Now, what great thing has God done for you and me in verse 18 there? He has reconciled us to Himself. We're going to look at that. The word reconcile, again going to Thayer's Greek Dictionary. It means to reconcile those who are at variance. You know, uh, you have an argument with your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your husband, your wife, your sibling, uh, your parents. How many ever had an argument? You separate, you go two different directions, and 
Um, one time my wife and I didn't talk for about a week, literally. 48 years of marriage, I guess it's not too bad that it happened just one time, but for we didn't talk for a week. I always tell people, one time I told my wife to shut up. I'm the man of this house. I didn't see her for a week after that. But finally I could open my left eye just a little. And uh, But anyway, the point is when there is difference in relationships, there's variance, reconciliation needs to happen. People need to get together and reconcile, Right? And that's what this word means. It said that God through Jesus Christ has reconciled us to Himself. So, that the word means return to favor with, be reconciled to one, to receive one in the favor. So, now why did we need reconciled to God? I'm not such a bad guy. You know what the problem with people is when they deal with God? We think God grades on the curve. I'm better than that guy. God must be happy with me. You ever have a teacher that graded on the curve? It would have been wonderful. I'm not sure I ever had one. Would have been wonderful. If the highest grade, instead of, you know, a lot of times when they grade on scale, a lot of times you got to get uh, 92 or higher to get an A. When you grade by the curve, the highest score is an A. So if the highest score was 33, 33 was an A. And we get the idea God grades on the curve. So I'm safe because I got only 33, but my neighbor got 17. So God's got to be pretty happy with me. Problem is, it's not the way a holy God operates. If you've heard me tell you so many times, God only accepts perfection. It's all He accepts. I'm not perfect, but I'm going to heaven. You say, how? you're just contradicting yourself. No, I'm not. We're going to get into that. Hang with me. We're going to show you how God only accepts perfection, and I get to go to heaven. Just hang in there a couple minutes. All right. So here's why. Look at Isaiah said in the Old Testament, verses 1 and 2 of chapter 59. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, Neither is ear heavy that it cannot hear. But listen, but your iniquities, that word means your sins, your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid His face from you that He will not hear. So Isaiah is prophesying to Israel the Word of God. And God is saying to Israel, your God isn't powerless to save you. His arm isn't too short to save you. I'm not a deaf God. I can hear you. But the reason nothing happened when you're asking is because your sins have separated you from me. All right? Listen to what Jesus said when he was here. This would, if people in America today would take time to read this verse, they wouldn't know what to do with it. It's not what we're being taught today. Listen to what he said, Jesus. Call me crazy, I think Jesus is an expert on the subject. Jesus said, He that is not with me is against me. He that is not with me is against me. And he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Jesus, in essence, drew a line on the sand. In the sand said, You're on this side or that side. It's amazing because politicians in both parties today tell us just the silliest stuff. Uh, they tell us that everything's acceptable. God loves everyone, going to take everyone to heaven. Um, and God would love to take everyone to heaven, so He built this special door that people could go through to get there. Um, but most people don't want to go through the door to get there. They want to uh, just think, I want to be there and get there. But anyway... So they say, no, no, everything's acceptable to God. Uh, uh, God's a God of love. He loves everybody. Everyone's going to heaven. And here Jesus said, if you're not for me, you're against me. You say, this is the good news you're talking about? It's going to get really good here. But to make stuff really good, you've got to have a contrast. This is how bad it was. 
God told Israel through the prophet Jeremiah, I'm not listening because of your sins. Jesus told us, here's a line. You're either on my side or you're against me. All right? Flip the page over if you would. What important truth do we learn from that? If we are on Jesus' side, then we're fighting against Him. Now, before I enlarge on that, we're going to give you some more information, but I've got to get verse 19 in here. Verse 19 of the chapter we're in, which is um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Uh, verse 19 says, To wit. That's why I like the King James. You don't see words, to wit. Now, some people take the O out and say twit or something, but uh, you don't see to wit anymore. They don't talk that way. To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto Himself. In other words, causing those who wanted a right relationship with Him to have one. He was settling what separates man from God's sin. So God was doing something to solve the sin issue so that people didn't have to be separated from Him. All right? So it said, To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto Himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. That word imputing is a bookkeeping term, where you write down all the financial figures or whatever. In other words, it's talking about God isn't keeping record. That's what imputing it means. He's not imputing their sins unto them or their trespasses. And then beyond that, he says, and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. So, uh, this idea here where it said, to wit that God was in Christ reconciling, in the Greek, Vincent, another Greek scholar said, the two words that ought to go together was reconciling. So, was God was reconciling in or through Christ. So, the, the was, not that he was in Christ, but that he was through Christ, he was reconciling. So it's the was and the reconciling that go together in this verse. So God was, re- and so you see in the e, uh, English Standard Version there that that is in Christ God was reconciling the world to Himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Now, Romans five verses six through ten. This is neat. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, at just the right time that means, when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Now, Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown, looking at the Greek, they're a commentary group, looking at, in other words, they wrote commentary in the whole Bible. Uh, And they're looking at this scripture in the King James, when we were yet without strength, And they're explaining what the Greek means there. And what it means is, we were powerless to deliver ourselves and so ready to perish. In other words, verse 6 said, when we were yet without strength, in essence is saying, when we were hopelessly lost. Because God demands perfection. There's no way to save yourself after your first sin. You can't do away with your first sin. You can't ever undo your first sin. So when God come to save me, I was hopelessly lost. I was, some translations render it, powerless to help myself. There was nothing I could do to get me from against Christ to for Christ. To get me on God's side. There was nothing I could do. I didn't have the power to save myself. God isn't looking for reformation. He's looking for salvation. He doesn't want you to be a reformed sinner. He wants you to be a saved Christian. All right? So, now, he's saying God reconciled the world unto Himself down here uh, in Romans before we go through that really exciting part of verse 19. He said, when we were yet powerless to help ourselves, in other words, Christ died for the ungodly. Verse 7, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. Verses 8 and 9, this is God's commentary to you and me. 
But God commendeth His love toward me in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Verse 9, Much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. Now listen to verse 10. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. What is God's commentary to me? When He came to save me, I was a sinner and His enemy. That would be like going behind the enemy lines and saving the people trying to kill you from someone trying to kill them. He came through Jesus behind the enemy lines and trust me, the world was against Jesus so much that they killed Him. Jesus came behind the enemy lines of which I was there. All have sinned, the Bible says in Romans 3.23, and therefore we were all enemies of God. And God said, but I love those guys and gals, so what am I going to do? There was really no dilemma. He knew all along what he'd do, but I'm just talking in human terms there. So, he sent Jesus to die for me. Now, what important truths do we learn from that uh, Roman passage? Christ died for us because we were powerless to save ourselves. Verse 6, God showed His love for us by having His Son die for us while we were yet sinners. Verse 8, when we were sinners, we were enemies. Verse 10, and why did God in Christ need to reconcile us? Verses on the other side and so forth, this is what we covered so far. Our sins had separated us from a holy God, Isaiah 59, 2. We were against Jesus, that is, we were on the other side, Matthew 12, 30, and we were God's enemies, Matthew, I mean, Romans 5, 10. This is why God had to reconcile us. We were at variance with Him. So back to verse 19. How did God reconcile you and me to Him? What did God do to take this imperfect sinner? Yeah, I don't know if that's the right way to put it. I was pretty much a perfect sinner. I had really perfected sinning. But I was imperfect as regards to righteousness. Now, how did God take this guy here, who was his enemy, and reconcile or make me right with him? There is absolutely nothing separating me from a holy God. Nothing. Now, I couldn't make that happen. I was powerless. Something God made happen. Now, what did He do? It said that the way God reconciled you was something happened that enabled him to quit recording your sins. Now, when I got saved, the Bible teaches me all my past sins were washed away. The day I was saved, I had no marks against me anymore. And now, since I've been saved, because I'm still not perfect, I still mess up. Yeah, me too. But he's not putting it down in the record book of heaven. He's not recording my sins against me. So if you could somehow sneak into heaven, good luck with that. But if you could somehow sneak in and get into the record room and look up my records. And say, I'm going to see what kind of a guy he really is. And you'd find this giant book with my name on it and you knew it was this David Hanna right here. And you somehow got it off the shelf, onto the floor, and you opened the page to get all the dirt on me. Because nobody would know more about me than God. You'd open that thing and you'd find one word in that giant book. Justified. Yeah. Or... If you prefer, reconcile. That's what we're talking about today. 
You know, people used to tell me when I was a young Christian that when you get to heaven on Judgment Day, they're going to bring down the big screen. And when you're approaching God to be judged that day, all of your sins you ever committed on earth are going to be flashed there in front of everybody. And then I started reading the Bible and I figured out how wrong that was. The Bible said, as far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed my sin from me, never to be remembered against me again. God isn't going to remind me of any of my sins in heaven. Did God, has God forgotten my sins? He has forgotten my sins in the sense of legality. He sees all my sins forgiven. I don't believe, humanly speaking, He's forgotten anything. I mean, He's he remembers everything. He knows everything. But he's forgotten them legally. There are no sins on my record books. You know, on, the, on Judgment Day, he opens the books, those being the book of records. And then he opens the book of life. And if you've got things against you in the record books, then your name better be in the book of life. That's how it works. But the good news is, if your name's in the book of life, you got nothing against you in the record books. Thank you, Lord. Amen? So, what I want you to see here, God did this amazing thing for this guy who was his enemy. He snuck behind the enemy line, Jesus, the Son of God, and did something, and I always explain it this way. you got to get a hundred on the test, or you flunk. One mistake, one sin. Once you reach the age of accountability, you know right from wrong. And I don't mean the right from wrong as today's society sees it. I mean right from wrong as God sees it. Once you reach the age of accountability and you know the difference in right and wrong, and you do something wrong, you can't pass because He demands a hundred. You flunk the test. From the very first day you sinned, you flunked the test. Even if He'd have given it to you again, you'd have flunked again. And if He'd given it to you again, you'd have flunked again. So God had to do something to get me an A. And only a hundred can give me an A. So He sent His beloved Son down to earth to take the test for me. See the test was graded on the law of Moses. And we all failed. We, we broke sin. Just think of just the simple Ten Commandments, how many of them we've broken. So God sent Jesus down here as a baby because He had to live His life for 33 years without breaking one of God's laws to get an A. And because He got an A, God told us how this was going to work in the Old Testament when they offered animal sacrifices. He said the animal has to be without spot or blemish. Jesus couldn't have just come out of heaven and assumed the form of a man and died for me because he hadn't been inspected yet as to whether or not he was without spot or wrinkle. So he had to live his life in absolute perfection. So he took the test and got a hundred. You say, what good does that do me? That doesn't give me a hundred. Yes, it does. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, I always tell people, picture yourself at the foot of the cross while Jesus is up there dying. And he's in, even though he's in a tattered blood all over his, uh, out without uh, his um, robe that he was wearing because they beat, they stripped him of the robe, beat him until he bleeding everywhere, put the robe back on. Uh, he was a mess every which way. But God gives you spiritual sight. And you see beyond the physical condition of Jesus. And you see Him in His heavenly white robe of righteousness. Not a blemish on it. Nothing but absolute perfection. And you fall down on your knees at the foot of that cross. And you're, the Bible said, all my righteousness is a filthy rag. And I'm kneeling at the foot of the cross in my filthy, torn uh, robe of unrighteousness. And Jesus looks down at me and slipped. 
Now you say you can't do that in the cross. I'm talking about spiritual vision. This is what's going on in the spirit world. He slipped out of that beautiful white robe of righteousness and drops it down to me. And that gives me the courage to strip out of my filthy rags of sin and hand them up to Him. And He slipped into those filthy rags of my sin and died for me. He paid the penalty for what I did. And I slipped into His robe of righteousness and I get the credit for what He did. Now you tell me whether there's another deal like this anywhere in the universe. He got the blame for my junk and died a brutal death for it. And I get the credit for His hundred and get to go to heaven. Pretty amazing if you ask me. So what does He tell me to do now? In verse thirty or 20 at the bottom. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead that you be reconciled to God. Now God says this amazing thing that you've just learned. Go tell others about it. They can be right with God. God has paid for their sin. So what do I have to do? What did I have to do? I tell people when I preach funerals. You know, people come to funerals because they know a family member or they knew the uh, deceased. And I tell people, no, no matter how much you wanted to be in this room at the funeral home here, there was only one way to get in it. doesn't matter. You could have sat home and said, I really want to be there. Wouldn't have put you there. You can sit home and say, I really want to go to heaven. Won't put you there. To go to that funeral, you had to walk through the door that led you first into the home and then another door that led you into the room. You could have stood in the hallway there and missed the whole funeral service. You had to go through a door to get into that room. Jesus said, I am the door. No man comes unto the Father but by me. The only way to get into heaven is to walk through the door that God provided, which is Jesus. So we get back to Romans uh, verse 17 of last week's study of any man be in Christ. When you come through Jesus, you put your faith in what He did at Calvary for you. You put your faith in Him as your Savior. You know, I'm, I keep telling people, I'm going to write a song one of these days. God, how can you love me when I don't even like myself? Yeah. I'm going to tell you something. The thing that blows me away is I see every wart. Yeah. Yeah. God sees only perfection when He looks at me. There's nobody who knows me outside of God who sees only perfection when He looks at me. Some people look at me and say, You jerk. It blows my mind that God can look at this and see the finished product. I have been reconciled to God and my message to you and everybody else, be you reconciled to God.